In this lecture, I plan to discuss the Battle of the Granicus, fought in May of 334 BC. This is the first of the four great battles of Alexander the Great, and in some, and in some ways it is the most controversial. Uh, we have two different descriptions of the battle, one by Arian, and uh, Plutarch's anecdotes are consistent with Arian's account. The other is by Diodorus Siculus, and I prefer the Arian Plutarch account uh, for a number of reasons based on not only the sources but my own survey of the topography of that battlefield. I've been on that battlefield several times. The battle is significant uh, in a number of ways. It essentially delivered Asia Minor uh, west of the Taurus Mountains to Alexander and allowed Alexander to pursue a strategy of neutralizing the Persian imperial fleet by capturing the various ports along the Aegean and Mediterranean shore, which were the homes to the majority of the sailors in the Persian navy. And so essentially they, they went home and stopped serving the great king. Uh, it also forced the great king to take the field himself because Alexander defeated a group of satraps, that is the governors of the provinces of Asia Minor, and so this battle was decisive. It shattered the Persian army, and for the first time the Persians had a look at what the Macedonian army could do. When the situation dawned in May of 334 BC, that is Alexander was now in Asia with a large army, the satraps quickly assembled their forces. Uh, we're not sure who is in overall command of this army. The battle is fought in the uh, satrapy known as Hellespontine Phrygia along the shores of the Sea of Marmara today, which the ancients would call the Propontis. And it's fought along the banks of a small river known as the Granicus, today the Bigachaya. And actually uh, it's um, tributary, the Kochachaya, and that, we'll get to that in a moment. Furthermore, uh, there were satraps, and uh, not only satraps, but other high-ranking Persian officials, and uh, a Greek mercenary commander by the name of Memnon of Rhodes. Memnon of Rhodes was not just a hired help. Memnon had married uh, a woman named Barsine, who had been the, actually the wife of his older brother, uh, her, he was, she was the widow of his brother Mentor, and therefore he was married into one of the most illustrious houses in the Persian Empire. Uh, Barsini's father was the satrap um, Artabazis, who is one of the senior men in the Persian Empire, and when he comes over to Alexander the Great in 330 BC, that's essentially a signal for all the other Persian nobles to follow. And so Memnon was regarded as essentially one of the club, one of the ruling um, members of Asia Minor, Persian Asia Minor. Memnon urged at uh, a conference held at Zella, which is less than a day's march away from the Granicus, that the satraps, whose army was very uh, well represented with heavy cavalry and Greek mercenary infantry, should not engage Alexander directly, but should pursue a war of attrition. He urged that the uh, fields be burned, that the cities of Ionia, that is the Greek cities of Western Asia Minor, be garrisoned, and that within a very short time, Alexander would run into supply difficulties, and the army would either disband or there would be an opportunity to destroy the army after it had been weakened. The satraps rejected this advice. They were not about to torch their fields, uh, and there are certain reasons for this. One, it was their fields, it would be their incomes, but second, they could not carry out such a strategy, really plausibly, as governors of the great king and simply say, well, this young Macedonian king showed up, we don't know who he was, and we decided to burn down half of Asia Minor because we really didn't want to fight him. Uh, that was just not possible. They were there to fight a major battle. They had no idea of the qualities of the Macedonian army. They thought it was just another weird version of Greeks, and they had as many Greek heavy infantry as Alexander did. And so with good reason, they decided to fight, and they established a battle line on the Granicus, which some scholars have claimed is flawed. Uh, and I don't think it was really a flawed battle line. It's very similar to the way Darius would deploy his army at Issus a year later. Uh, it was just that it, the plan was obvious. It was a typical way of, of the Persians fighting. And in any of these situations, once Alexander came on the battlefield and observed the disposition of the enemy forces, he had a remarkable sense of terrain and geography. He could think very three-dimensionally in his mind. He, he could see where the weaknesses were in the enemy line. He could divine their plan immediately and then come up with a counter to it. And this was the danger of fighting Alexander, that no matter what plan you, you came up with, if you have put your men on the battlefield, Alexander would look at it, 
and could see the weaknesses, could understand what you were attempt to achieving, to, uh, attempting to achieve, and uh, come up with a counter immediately. And Napoleon had the same quality, and in this way, Granicus in some ways is comparable to the way uh, Napoleon could see the, read the terrain at Austerlitz, is one of his greatest victories, the Battle of the Three Kings, as it's called. In any event, as I said, we, had, uh, we have three uh, accounts, uh, two accounts of the battle, uh, two different versions of it, and the Diodorus account is believed by some scholars, but the majority go with the account of Arian and Plutarch, and that is the account that I, I prefer to follow, and that's based not only, as I said, on the sources, but my own experience of walking that battlefield. It was sometime late in May of 334 BC, and Alexander had a large army of about 50,000 men. The Persian army was, we think, about comparable size, maybe a bit smaller. The Persians drew up their battle line along the Granicus River. From north to south, uh, the battle line ran probably well over two miles. Uh, the uh, northern or right flank of the Persian army was protected by marshes in that part of the uh, uh, world, especially in the spring. Uh, you really can't operate cavalry in marshes. If you walk out there you know, in armor, you just sink to your knees in no time. Their left wing was anchored on the confluence of the Biga Chaya today and the Kocha Chaya, that is the Granicus and its tributary. So to get around the Persian left flank, you essentially had to cross two rivers. And the riverbanks there are quite high, and it would be difficult to move forces and maintain discipline and really to elude uh, Persian detection. The main forces of the Persians were thus drawn up on the riverbank, on the east bank, and that bank is significantly higher than the west bank, that is the bank that would be occupied by the Macedonians. Furthermore, the river is relatively small. It uh, flows essentially in this time of the year in the middle of the riverbed, and it's a very sandy riverbed with a lot of smooth stones, and very quickly any men fighting in this uh, wide riverbed uh, would find themselves in very slippery conditions. The Persian satraps in Arcites, who is the satrap of that region, was probably an overall command, with the agreement, I suspect, of Memnon, decided that they would draw up the Persian cavalry and these were largely Persian colonists settled in Asia Minor, as well as Anatolian levies who were armed similarly to the Persian forces. They drew up their forces behind the river bank, uh, high up. The position was ideal for defense. The Persians have often been criticized for doing this, but Persian cavalry was not shock cavalry the way the Macedonians were. Persians were armed with missile weapons, and the idea was that when the Macedonian army advanced, went into the riverbed, the Persians would break up those formations by throwing javelins and shooting arrows into them. And the likelihood is the Macedonian attack would just falter and the Macedonians would fall back. But in the event that they did get over that river bank, the Persians had deployed their cavalry in such a way that they could move to the wings of their Greek mercenary infantry who were drawn up behind them on the high ground. And then what you would have would be a powerful center of Greek heavy infantry armed with a hoplite thrusting spear and flanked by superb Persian cavalry, and they would simply move and drive the Macedonian army back into the Granicus River. The plan was by no means flawed. I mean, it was a logical plan for the Persians to adopt. Uh, the problem was when Alexander appeared on the battlefield, he knew exactly what those Persians were attempting to do. Late in the afternoon, uh, Alexander's army came across the open plain, uh, called by Justin the Plain of Adrestus, and that plain uh, had um, essentially no obstacles to it. Uh, to the right of Alexander's army, that would be to the south, was high ground where Alexander could easily get up and survey the Persian positions. And you have to remember, those Persian soldiers and Greek mercenaries, they've been standing there all day. Undoubtedly, they hadn't had a particularly good army day. They were put in position early in the day and waiting. The Macedonian army arrived, and Alexander conducted an extremely difficult move. It reminds you of the kind of awe and audacity that he displayed at the city of Pelion against the Illyrians. He moved his army out of line of march into line of battle so that they actually deployed in front of the Persian army out of bowshot. Uh, Parmenio, who saw the Persian positions, according to Arian, said, look, um, 
Why bother attacking now? It's late in the day. Let's wait for the Persians to withdraw. And then we probably can cross the river either unopposed because the Persians are not there or at least come up with a more conventional battle. And throughout Arian's account, Parmenio acts as a foil. And we're not sure if he always said this, but uh, in any event, Parmenio is used by uh, Arian as a way to represent the more cautious and older generation of, of officers. Some scholars believe that this has uh, you know, been deliberately done to magnify Alexander and, and diminish the achievement of Parmenio. Parmenio always was second in command, and he always commanded the left wing, the left half of the Macedonian army. His loyalty was unquestioned, and he clearly was a very, very able tactician. Nonetheless, Alexander rejected this advice, and if we accept this tradition, he saw immediately that the Persians had put themselves in a flawed position. Riverbanks are not straight lines, and riverbanks always have exposed positions. Alexander saw two points. One was that the problem with Persian cavalry was to get it to commit into hand-to-hand -hand combat, into close order combat, where the companion cavalry could really make headway given their superior discipline, they fought in tight units, and their lances. So the idea was to lure at least part of that Persian cavalry off the high ground into the riverbed. Once in that riverbed, the companion cavalry could confine Persian movement and essentially mow them down with their lances and push the Persians up and off the riverbank and flank the army. That meant if you could break the enemy position at one point and get your Macedonian cavalry up there, the rest of the Macedonian army could probably cross with very little opposition because the Persians would essentially quit the field. And to do this, he adopted a rather unusual variation of the Battle of Encirclement. In classic Macedonian battles, the companion cavalry occupied a position close to the infantry. Uh, Alexander assembled his six regiments of the phalanx, eight deep rather than 16 because it was a long battlefront. The hypasopists took their position on the right uh, next to the phalanx regiments. But instead of the companion cavalry, Alexander deployed various light cavalry, notably the prodromi, the scouts, Thracian units. And then the companion cavalry was on the far right. The Thessalian and Greek mercenary cavalry was on the left, commanded by Parmenio. In front of Alexander's companions on the far right of the Macedonian line were light infantry and the Agrianian, the javelin men. What Alexander did was order attack in two waves. Those various light cavalry formations between the companions and the hypasopists were ordered in first, and they hit a point along the riverbank where there was an angle. And according to the account of uh, Arian, the Macedonian army moved up in perfect discipline. Everyone stopped, took their breath, and then Amyntas, in command of the Prodromi, led these squadrons down into the riverbed. And the rest of the Macedonian army followed at a slower pace. The immediate reaction of the Persians was to, well, throw those javelins at them. Uh, the initial attack gets broken up. That's where probably most losses were suffered. And as the Macedonian and Thracian light horse fell back into the riverbed, the Persians were drawn off the riverbank to pursue and into the riverbed. Meantime, the companion cavalry had swung around on the right flank, descended into the river, and then came barreling down the river as if it were a bowling alley and smashed those Persian forces that were right in the riverbed. The impact was audacious and decisive. The Persians, who could not stand up to the heavily armed Macedonians, immediately attempted to regain the riverbank. Many of them fled in panic. There was some desperate fighting at this point. As Alexander's companions came over the riverbank, Alexander led the charge himself. He unhorsed one of the Persian commanders, a man named Mithridates, apparently a son-in-law of the king, uh, Darius III. He broke his lance in the process. A fellow named Reo Sakes, one of the Persian commanders, actually delivered a blow on Alexander's helmet, which was deflected and partially damaged, uh, and that may be the helmet in, in, in Tomb 2 at Vergina. Uh, Alexander was given a spear by uh, Demaratus of Corinth, one of the companions. He unhorsed this fellow, and in the process of killing the second Persian commander, another one called Spithridates came up to get Alexander with his scimitar, and Clytus the Black, that is the senior officer of Philip's generation, absolutely saved Alexander by severing the arm of this fellow, Spithridates, who fell from his horse. And later on, uh, Clytus reminded Alexander of that fact. 
The result of that combat was several of the Persian commanders were killed in quick succession in a matter of moments. The Macedonians pushed the Persian forces out of the riverbed uh, onto the riverbank, and the Persian left essentially fled the field. Uh, the other Persian cavalry forces, um, seeing this, too, quit the field. The rest of the Macedonian army that had advanced to the river bank and descended uh, came up and popped up on the east bank of the river. And all of a sudden, the entire Macedonian army was on the east side of the Granicus, and the Greek mercenary infantry were standing on this hilltop very alone. Uh, in fact, most of them were really quite puzzled because they didn't expect to do any serious fighting that day. Immediately, uh, the Greeks offer a deal that they will go into Alexander's service or at least surrender on terms. Alexander refuses to accept those terms. He orders the Greek mercenaries to be surrounded and liquidates the force. Uh, we're told there were 20,000. Uh, that might be too high, but we do know that there were 2,000 survivors. Uh, they were all taken captives and sent back to Macedon to work in the quarries. Alexander was making a point. You do not serve the great king of Persia if you are a Greek. Uh, and the result was that the message got out. Now, many of the mercenaries long in Persian service would fight on, but the idea was to prevent new men from signing up with the great king of Persia from the Greek world. The victory was stunning. Probably the cavalry battle lasted at most a matter of minutes. And within less than an hour, uh, the Greek mercenary army uh, forces had been destroyed, either killed or captured, and Alexander was master of the battlefield. The Persian cavalry had scattered. The Persians lost at least nine satraps and senior commanders. Arcites, who had commanded the forces, committed suicide later. Memnon of Rhodes survived the battle and later went on to command the Persian fleet in the Aegean, and he was a most dangerous opponent. The victory is uh, important for several reasons. For the first time, the Persians saw what the Macedonian army could do. And in the next encounter, Darius III, who would command the Persian army, would be a lot more careful in dealing with the Macedonians. The second point is that it essentially killed the Persian leadership in Asia Minor and disorganized the western satrapies in what is today Asiatic Turkey, uh, that is the region west of the Taurus Mountains. And therefore, there was very little coordinated resistance to Alexander for the rest of the year. And 334 BC was essentially a march, a long indirect march, going down the western shore of Turkey, liberating the Greek cities of Ionia, moving in the tough regions of Caria through the uh, coastal cities of Pamphylia on the southwestern shores of Asia Minor, and uh, across the rugged uh, Pisidian highlands to the city of Gordian, which is on the plateau of Asia Minor and was really one of the major Persian centers. It's the old Phrygian capital. It was home to King Midas, the legendary king of the Phrygians. Well, in effect, Alexander had won most of the regions that we think Philip of Macedon might have aimed for within a year. Certainly it was these areas that the Panhellenists, such as the Socrates, targeted as the region to conquer. Uh, however, uh, this was not going to satisfy Alexander, and in the next year, he would cross the Taurus Mountains and move into what the Greeks would call Upper Asia, that is, the more distant areas uh, farther from the Mediterranean shore. The victory at the uh, Granicus solved uh, Alexander's financial and logistical problems immediately. As Alexander's army moved south from the Troad and followed the traditional routes, to the western cities of Asia Minor. These are the cities that were settled largely by Ionian peoples related to the Athenians in the Greek Dark Age in the 10th through the 8th century BC. These cities had been liberated in the Great War of 480 to 479 BC. They had been returned to Persian rule under the King's Peace of 386 BC. These cities now welcomed Alexander as their conqueror. And I suspect about the only Greek cities that really liked Alexander were those cities of Ionia and Asia Minor and Cyprus, which had been under Persian rule. As far as we could tell, these cities were not enrolled in the League of Corinth or the Hellenic League, but they undoubtedly had specific treaty relationships with Alexander. Uh, in many instances, Alexander had to halt uh, the usual reprisals in Greek city-states. He instituted democracies. The oligarchies or strongmen were thrown out. Uh, at the city of Ephesus, in which the great temple of Artemis had been burned down in 356 BC, at, you know, more or less at the time of Alex's birth, Alexander actually contributed money for the reconstruction of the shrine. 
Uh, he was greeted at the city of Priene uh, with great pomp and actually slept in a house there in the residence, which um, later on became a major tourist attraction. Alexander slept here. I'm sure almost every city in Asia Minor had such a place, most of them probably phony by the Roman age, but who's to tell? Um, the Romans will, you know, believe anything when they're on tour. And uh, his only resistance was encountered by two cities, the city of Miletus and the city of Halicarnassus. Now, those two cities were major ports on the southwestern shore of Asia Minor. And the city of Ephesus, which many of us have visited as tourists, only became a great port in the Hellenistic and Roman age. Actually, the city as you see it is the city rebuilt by Lysimachus, one of Alexander's generals. And Ephesus was not a particularly important port. Uh, the real ports were Miletus and uh, the island of Samos, and in the 4th century BC, Halicarnassus, which had been built up as a major port by the Carian dynasts because they made it their capital. And it is today the modern city of Bodrum, which is essentially the center of the, of the Turkish Riviera where all the gambling establishments and yachts go. I have to keep my students away from this place. It's much too dangerous for them. Uh, but a delight to visit uh, for those of us who know how to handle these things. Uh, in any case, he had to capture Miletus and Halicarnassus, which were heavily fortified. His fleet moved into position, and in antiquity, Miletus was on the southern shores of a huge bay, which is now silted up into a great alluvial plain. So when you visit Miletus, you have to position it on the shore. The city was quickly blockaded by the allied Greek fleet. Uh, the Persian fleet showed up too late to do anything. Uh, most of the population was favorable to Alexander. The small Persian garrison, largely Greek mercenaries, uh, withdrew to the citadel. Alexander's forces entered the city, and with his artillery and battering rams and towers, they quickly breached the citadel, captured the city. Uh, the navy blockaded the port, the Greeks in Alexander's service, and essentially the city fell with very little fighting. Uh, and Miletus was then again liberated and enrolled as an ally. The Persian fleet could do very little and eventually had to retire from the general vicinity of Miletus to Samos. It ran into supply problems. A number of the ships went home for the winter and Alexander decided at that point to disband his fleet. First, he was an hawk. He didn't know how to pay for these guys. Second, most of them were Athenians and he really didn't want the Athenians to fight the Persian fleet, which were Greeks from Cyprus and Phoenicia. And you never know who's going to be on what side when that happens. And so he was glad to get rid of the Athenian, uh, largely Athenian fleet. That meant when he moved against the next major port, Harley Carnassus, he did not have a fleet to blockade it. And the Persians could supply the garrison. That siege lasted for some, oh, over, almost 12 months. Again, the general population uh, of Halicarnassus was Greek. They would welcome Alexander. Uh, Alexander's uh, forces, uh, his engineers, made a breach in the walls on the north side of the city, broke into the city. There was hard fighting. Uh, one of the anecdotes is, the, is one of the assaults carry, was carried out because two men of Perdiccas's infantry battalion got drunk and dared each other, so they attacked the breach and the, the Macedonian army had to follow. Uh, but once they got into the city, again, the Greek mercenaries on Memnon's orders, that is Memnon of Rhodes, retired to the port where there were two fortifications, uh, two fortified positions in the harbor, and essentially maintained their position there for almost 12 months. Alexander realized it wasn't worth uh, besieging these cities, and he detached Ptolemy, son of Lagos, that is the future king of Egypt, to keep the city blockaded, and eventually uh, the garrison was forced to surrender. It, was, it surrendered shortly before the Battle of Issus in the next year. It was hoped by Memnon that Alexander would be distracted, attempt to, to capture this city, and Alexander was not going to deal with a, um, a secondary objective. He had more important things to do. First, the Greek cities and other coastal cities, particularly in the region of Lycia and the Greek and native cities on the shores of Pamphylia, most of them came over to Alexander's side and contributed, that is, provided money and provisions. The Greek word is syntaxis. In the areas that were not Greek, which were uh, notably the first major region, Lydia, which is immediately to the east of the Greek cities of Ionia, the Lydians are an ancient people of Asia Minor, long in association with the Greeks, uh, their city was Sardis. Alexander freed the Lydians so they could live under their own laws and appointed a Macedonian satrap, a man named Asander, and essentially announced by doing that that the conquest of the Persian Empire outside of the Greek cities uh, 
would be Macedonian, not Panhellenic. That is, as the satrapies fell to Alexander, Macedonians would be appointed to govern these regions, to command the military forces. Uh, the local populations would live under their own laws and customs, uh, as they had done under the Persians, and this was essentially Alexander's realm and had nothing to do with the Panhellenic League. The same was true in Caria, another people long in association with the Greeks. The Hecatominid Queen Ada was invested with power at her capital at Alinda. She adopted Alexander as her son and heir, and when she died in, I think it was 326 BC, Alexander essentially inherited Caria. Of course, there was a garrison there. When Alexander crossed onto the Great Plateau at Phrygia, the region known as Phrygia, which spans much of the inner half of the Asiatic Peninsula of Turkey today, uh, great grasslands and range, very, very fertile region for both winter wheat and barley, as well as stock raising, goats, uh, sheep, uh, cattle would be in great supply. Uh, at Gordian, Alexander very ostentatiously again uh, indicated to the Phrygians that they too would live under their own laws. The man that he put in charge of Central Asia Minor, Greater Phrygia, that is Phrygia of the Interior as opposed to Hellespontine Phrygia, Phrygia of the Shore, was Antigonus the One-Eyed, Monophthalmus, uh, a general uh, who was regarded as uh, almost as good as Parmenio, who had commanded the various mercenary forces in the expedition, and Antigonus uh, essentially controlled Asia Minor and the vital lines of communication between the expedition and the kingdom of Macedon, which was run by Antipater, who stayed back at Pella uh, with part of the Macedonian levy and supervised the Greek League. And it was a very intelligent use of senior men from Philip's generation. He had Antipater in Macedon. He had Antigonus in Asia Minor. Eventually, Parmenio was to take over Iran, but that didn't last long, and we'll get to it. And the advantage of Antipater and Macedon is Antipater didn't like Olympias, and Olympias didn't like Antipater, so they kind of neutralized each other. And Alexander, mo most of these are fictitious, but we have all these letters from antiquity, which purport to be letters of Alexander. Um, but they're, they're fun to read, and, and I get the suspicion reading these things that Alexander had to do an awful lot of letter writing back to mom and Antipater uh, to try to assuage the bruised feelings of both and hope that the two would more or less cooperate in running Macedon in his absence. In any event, uh, the conquests were spectacular. Alexander spent the winter of 334-333 BC in great comfort at Gordian. Uh, his uh, commanders, Coinus and uh, Meliager, led all the younger men back to Macedon, the newlywed men, because they could spend uh, time with their wives. They brought reinforcements from Macedon in the spring. Uh, and essentially, Alexander had a, no threat. Uh, the war would resume in the spring with a Persian offensive in the Aegean, a naval offensive, and the great king taking the field. Uh, but Alexander had Asia Minor more or less in hand. At Gordian, he could not help himself from solving an oracle. At the city of Gordian, which was the capital of the Phrygians, the Greeks claimed there was a legend, and this is more likely a Greek legend than a Phrygian legend, but there was a sacred chariot or cart of some sort uh, in which King Midas, the legendary king of the Phrygians, and I suspect there were a lot of kings of, of the Phrygians named Midas. It was a dynastic name, and the Greeks very, get very confused who they are. And this is the Midas of the Golden Touch. And unfortunately, uh, his ignominious fate in the United States is, I think he's, he's uh, the logo for a, for a muffler or something, for a car. You can't believe anything more ignominious. But in any event, King Midas... Uh, had this cart, and that's how he was received by the Phrygians. It was a, a royal cart. And there was a legend around, an oracle about, that this cart had an extremely complicated knot that held the harness to the cart. And that knot, known as the Gordian knot, if it could be loosened, and the Greek word is luo, which is very vague, you can do it in any of a number of ways, if it could be loosened, the man who did that would be the Lord of Asia. And at the time, Asia meant essentially Western Asia Minor. Um, it didn't really have the continental sense. But Zeus, I'm uh, sorry, Alexander, being what he was, um, solved it, and we have two reports. One was he pulled the pin out and the harness dropped. The one that Arian and Plutarch like is that he whipped out his sword and cut it with one blow, cut the Gordian knot, still used as an idiom today of how to solve a very complicated and intricate problem. Uh, the Macedonians cheered him on. The Phrygians probably were really quite 
bewildered by the whole thing. Uh, nonetheless, it was one of a number of instances in which Alexander felt compelled to solve oracles or to fulfill prophecies, and these contributed increasingly to his own self-image, where he came to regard himself as somehow a son of Zeus in the sense of Heracles, that is, his great deeds would allow him to mingle with the gods and join them at Mount Olympus on his death. Uh, for the Macedonian army in the winter of 334-333 BC, it was one of a number of instances of their king encouraging them, giving them a good winter quarters, and also attending upon the wounded, rewarding the brave. Alexander made sure that his men were in their best condition because next spring his army was going to march east and face the great king himself.